Hey, before we start the episode, this is just a reminder, this episode does take place before we had changed to a strictly interview format, and as such, there may be references to the other episodes we used to do that don't have anything to do with that. You can disregard that, and just enjoy the episode. The Graphic Histories Podcast. Welcome back to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, and I'm your host, and I would like to acknowledge and thank Ukla the Mock for providing our theme song, Superpowers. Love that song. Still love it. It never gets old to me. Uh, thank you for listening and coming back once again to our show, my this thing I've created, whatever you want to call it. It's here. It's now. And you're in it. So I hope you have been enjoying listening to these as much as I've been enjoying bringing them to you. Uh, This episode is a special treat. Uh, It's one of our interview episodes, which I love to do because I get to talk with some cool comic book people about my favorite subject, which is comic books. Very, very excited about that. And today we spoke with Andrew Clark, a good friend of mine who I met on the convention circuit several years ago, and he's one of the highlights of these events whenever I get to go to them. Uh, Usually our tables are somewhere near each other, and we get to talk through at the event. We usually go to dinner afterwards, hang out, have a few drinks. All that good, fun stuff. Andrew is a really cool guy, and I was really glad to talk to him. We learned a lot about his life. We had some discussions about politics, about what's going on with the states right now, and a lot about religion, actually, and sort of our takes on it, mainly due to the fact his father was a minister, which was kind of a surprising fact for me to hear, because Andrew is quite the opposite of that sort of person and from what I've, from the history we've had. So... Yeah, very excited for you to hear that. I had a lot of fun talking to him. Went a little long, but I'm going to put it all in there because it was a great chat, and I think we covered a lot as far as the industry, as far as his independent comic book, Adam, the genesis getting him there, and and his history in life and his viewpoints on the world. Uh, As far as what's going on in the comic world right now, uh, not a super big ton, although I'm very excited to to see that Barry Windsor Smith's Monsters is coming to Fantagraphic Books. Monsters is the book that... Smith has been working on for about 30 years. It's sort of his take on the Hulk, kind of a lumbering monster, experimented on by the government, going on, I don't say adventures, I don't think that's really the right way to look at it, but look it up, check it out. It looks like it's going to be a super cool, super dark, very interesting take on the superhero genre, bringing it to a world of more realism, which is really neat to see. Uh, Not a whole lot else going on out there in the the whole wide world of comics. few things here and there. Comics are kind of back up and running now, showing up in stores. I believe the single issues of DC books are still taking some time to get back in with COVID-19 sort of uh, restrictions loosening a bit. I know here in Nova Scotia, their active cases are down to like five, which is really cool to hear. And they're allowing groups of 10 now, as long as you keep your social distancing. A lot of more businesses are opening up, which is really neat to see. And it seems like the world is getting somewhat back on track as much as it can right now with everything going on. So that being said, I think it's time we roll into the interview portion of this podcast. Uh, This is Andrew Clark in our conversation. Enjoy. Uh, how old am I? 44 now. Oh, yeah. See, that's that's far too young to not know how to use technology, Andrew. <laughs> far too young. You have a son, a young son, do you not? How old is how old's your son? He tells me everything. Oh, he's the one yeah. that keeps you in the loop? Yeah. <laughs> that's good. He that's can. good to have. And anytime I have computer problems, I just call my friend and they come fix it. <laughs> yeah, that's Good to have oh, one of those. Yeah. <laughs> A problem with a thing or whatnot. How are you holding up during all this COVID-19 insanity? I'm holding up fine. I'm uh, just working through it and, you know, getting as much drawing done as I can. Got a couple yeah. projects on the go. So. Yeah, what are you working on now? 
Um, I'm working on a well, besides Adam six is done, so I'm sort of planning out Adam number seven. So that'd be I issue six, yeah. <laughs> issue six of your series, Adam. That's that's yeah. what you just finished up. It's excellent. Yeah. Um, and I'm working on a story. Um, there's a fellow named Dan who did the story in the uh, True Patriot anthology thing we did with um, the, I think it was the Canadian Sentinel. Mm -hmm. I might have that wrong. Uh, <laughs> but he wrote a different story. So I'm doing something with him that's supposed to go into another digital release to anthology. Thing. And then uh, I'm also working on something with Tony White. Oh, yes. Tony White with uh, yeah. what? what's. What's the name of that the the company that that's under? Is True North, is it? Uh, uh, Chapter House. Chapter House, right? Yeah. Okay. So I tried. I can't remember. I think it was. I think True Patriots or Anthology series, and that's, that's right. I was, uh, that's right. That's I don't right. know why that was in quotation. <laughs> yeah, quote finger quotations are good for podcasts. People can exactly. totally hear <laughs> the waving of the fingers in the air. There's a, a slight shift. <laughs> the tonal tonal recognition. Uh, I'm enjoying this. I'm glad I'm going to get have a chance to have you on here because uh, you're the first. Well, I mean, you're only the second interview I've done, but you're also the first as a person I've known. I actually kind of know, so I feel like it's going to be slightly more relaxed for that reason. It's like give you the business, as it were. The business. The business. The business. Put me on the spot. That's right. So uh, where did where did young Andrew grow up? Where did where did where were the origins of this 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 being? Uh, well, I'm from I'm from here, Halifax. Uh, but when um, I was about four years old, we moved to Alberta. My dad got a promotion, so we moved out there until about grade four, and then we moved back here. So, what does your father do? He is, believe it or not, a retired minister. Uh, really? Yeah. That's inc crazy. Yeah. What's it like growing up being the son of a minister? It's funny because uh, when I spoke with Ed, I know you mentioned you listened to that one, uh, Ed Burson. Mm -hmm. He talked about how, you know, there was that that level of son of a police officer, son of a minister, kind yeah. of the, the, those two tropes <laughs> of the kid that acts up. So were you that kid? or? Yeah, a little bit. He wasn't a minister my whole life. He, uh, he was actually in junior high. He decided... He wanted to be a minister, and, and he, we weren't a religious family, and it really came out of the blue to us. Really? Yeah, and um, apparently he, as a child, he, he grew he grew up in a house where his, his dad had died really young, mm -hmm. and so he lived with his mom, but she worked all the time, and he had a brother, so he ended up hanging out uh, at the minister's house down the street quite often. Minister, not priest, so he's a saint. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so we tell him. Yeah. Um, so he used to pretend to be a minister and walk around in a robe and a Bible and do his thing. And apparently, it's a big thing in his life. And he just one day was at work and decided, hey, I'm going to do it. So you know, I'm moving in with his mom for many years in junior high down in the North End. And and he went to school to be a minister. And that's what he did. Well, well, what did he do before before that? He, he was a bond manager. I'm not sure if you know what that is, basically. It's like, uh, in my understanding, it's like insurance for big companies and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're filling out an application for a job and it says, are you bondable? Oh, okay. It's that kind of stuff. Like you so he'd investigate if people were bondable or that sort of thing or uh, that sort of stuff or businesses too. I remember him telling me a story once about like uh, uh, a restaurant had burnt down, so he had to go check into it to sort of make sure that the burning down was only up enough. To oh, it's so kind of like an insurance claims adjuster sort of. Yeah, kind of. Okay, yeah. interesting. So, how old were you when he did when he dropped this bombshell on the family? Did he just stand up one day and said, "I'm going to be a minister now"? And yeah, he. Uh, we, I was in junior high. And I don't remember exactly what day it was or what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I just remember and he was just decided I want to be a minister. And I was like, oh, yeah, minister of what? Like fisheries? Or... <laughs> 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 it's oddly, at that point, Souls. we the church maybe every second Christmas, maybe we might have. Really? Gone. So you guys didn't even, you weren't avid churchgoers or? No. no. And he but... was always a big reader and he was always reading you know, books on religion and different history and stuff like that. But it, Interesting. It never really pushed it on us. And 
and even when he got into it, he, he, he told his biggest mistake was he said, I'm not going to push this on you, but I want you to understand it. So I had to do a fair bit of reading on it too. Mm -hmm. And my takeaway on it was not the same as his. And, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to convert him, which didn't work. <laughs> you, you try to convert him out of religion? That's what you Yeah, yeah. yeah? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, you know, Dad, you know, if they found Lord of the Rings 2,000 years from now, they had lost it. And then yeah. someone just found it 2,000 years from now. They would think that that stuff was all real. <laughs> <laughs> At, what was his response to that? He just, basically what you just did, he just kind of laughed. And, and then he used the one word that I absolutely despise. I don't want to turn this into a religion argument. No, it's, it's <laughs> look. You're not uh, you're not preaching to the choir because I, <laughs> I feel like I feel like you and I are, are in the same boat. So, uh, he used he used the one word that I can't stand to this day. It's, it's my least favorite word in the English language called faith. Oh yeah, I hate the word faith. <laughs> it's basically we can't prove this. We also can't prove it, mm. but because of faith. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, I faith, have faith that someday a giant chocolate teddy bear is going to walk down the street, and I'm going to eat that giant chocolate teddy bear, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> sir, I would like to know more about this giant chocolate teddy bear religion <laughs> and how I can sign up for it, because it sounds like something I could totally be on board for. It's got those little uh, Rice Krispies uh, pieces in it and everything. Ah, oh, those are the best. Oh, man, I'm in. I'll be a deacon <laughs> or a bishop or whatever you need. That's right, um, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Faith is one of those words that is used to gloss over almost anything, like anything or anyone with, with any kind of a differing opinion. It, I mean, I think, I think part of going on faith might be sort of the issue with a lot of the problems in the world at this, at this moment. You know, people denying climate change and, and back, anti-vaxxers and all these sort of people with the, have some weird internal faith that they know better than experts and scientists. And I actually you know, just made this up, so I don't know if it's going to sound good. It just popped in my head as you were talking. But faith is the shield of the ignorant. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's you your, like that? your book title. That's, that's, that's the Andrew Clark uh, biography. That's, that's the title. See, that's, a really, that's, like that's a great line. You should throw that in one of your future comics. I will. Most of whatever I say or think goes into acts. That's interesting. So do you, you have any uh, siblings? I have a brother. Uh, he's uh, older than me. He lives in Port of Basque, Newfoundland. Oh, well, I've been there before. It's a nice area. Yeah. I haven't been there. No? He's trying to get me to visit him. And he doesn't paint a very good picture of Port of Basque, so I'm like, why would I come? He's like, well, he oh, Newfoundland he's itself is a... Like, I got pictures. I'm good. <laughs> Newfoundland itself is a pretty province. I've uh, I've been there uh, with some of my other job wrestling several times, and I've uh, really enjoyed, really enjoyed it. It's beautiful countryside, and nice, really nice people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I could visualize Port of Basque right off the top of my head, but it's uh, I remember being there, or wrestling there at least. Yeah, you get right off the ferry, and apparently it's right. Yeah, there. I was going to say it's where the ferry leaves. I remember yeah. watching one day after one of the tours. I was sitting in the hotel in the morning watching the bus head back to, to no or not the bus the uh the boat head back to nova scotia yeah and i remember having Imagine, a strong yeah. urge to get on that boat he manages the shopper's drug mart oh really just get off the boat he manages that so. and uh what is it, your mother uh, what does she do she's dead oh i'm sorry to hear that no she's not she um <laughs> <laughs> very nice <laughs> very nice sir this is what i came to expect from you she, Fantastic. Uh, um um not to wax poetic too much she's a very strong woman my, my dad's health got really bad after a while so she he's, they still live together um he got her pregnant in high school okay uh, so they how old my brother 47 they've been together for 47 years okay and so they're still used, together then, is what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's, she's the strongest woman I know. If my dad's not an easy guy to live with. Just no, the guy that just suddenly has a religious epiphany and uproots his life uh, on a whim, that, that guy wasn't easy to live with? He's not the easiest guy to live with. Did Great he have like balance. a history of sort of um, like running off and doing stuff or just getting something in his head he had to do it? Or is this, or is he just sort of had a mundane life that totally... Pig-headed. He's got... 
he's he's a hemophiliac. Which oh, sure know what that is? <laughs> yes, I'm very familiar. I don't. I'm not one, but I know what it no, is. Well, as, as a wrestler, I hope you're not. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say my <laughs> part of my career choice might have had to change uh, if that well, was the that case. was that was part of his problem is that he wasn't supposed to do things and he was really into sports and stuff like that. Things that could kind of really buggered believe. up his body quite badly, so he's got chronic pain through his whole body. And uh, he can hardly walk. Now. He's only is that a like you don't you're not hemoph- hemophiliac, are you? Uh, no. So it's some you get it from birth. You're just born with it, and the mother has to be the carrier of it. Oh, okay. And you I didn't have know that. to be. It has to. If I remember correctly, it's it's the second born son who will have it. I don't know why. Really? So he has an older brother that doesn't have it, but he does. Interesting. And then when my son was born, we had to check him. They were pretty sure he would have his gen would have to be the carrier for it. Oh wow! Okay, that's very interesting. I'm learning so much about hemophilia. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what was the so okay? So your your dad's a priest now, and uh, what did your minister. mom do? But, or minister? Sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, what what religion is he a minister? Uh, he was part of the United Church. Uh, was it like Presbyterian or Anglican or? Uh, United, um, was it United uh, Protestant religion, whatever. The right. ones that accept everybody, apparently. Yeah, my mom's an Anglican, and they're very. Both those religions are like the same, essentially. Yeah, Anglican, I think, as far as I understand, is like it's like Catholic life. Yeah, I think so. But their priests can or their ministers can marry and and have all yeah. you know the normal stuff because because uh, that minister like mom. We went to mom's church, but we were baptized and went through dad's church, which was Catholic. So uh, mom was Anakin. And then like the priest, it's funny how we, we talked earlier about Lord of the Rings and religion. Uh, the priest or the minister at that church, his wife was the Protestant minister of the church down the road. So, okay. uh, but that priest, I was an altar boy when I was a kid and, uh, and he was, it was Anglican. So uh, <laughs> not, nothing untoward happened. Uh, he was a really cool guy actually. Um, yeah. But he introduced me to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings when I was a kid. Yeah, because he was a big fan, and he's like, you should read these books, and gave them to me. And I, I was hooked from the start. So, Actually, his wife is the minister in Truro, the place I live right now. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, so it's funny. It all, all kind of comes around in an interesting way, especially in small communities like here in Nova Scotia. I've actually told my dad that uh, when he dies... <laughs> It's, it's a good conversation starter. When you're dead, Dad, I'm gonna do some stuff. <laughs> when he dies, because he, you know, he brought up the whole. You know, well, my mom did like. I'm hope she hopes she can get me to do a reading and stuff, and I was like, well, I don't really know because it'd be very disingenuous and stuff. So I told him what I was gonna do is his mom's gonna make me do this. He said, so I'm gonna go up with a book under my arm. Put it down, open it up, look at everybody, and just say, "I'm going to do a brief reading from from the book, chapter two, verse three, paragraph nine. And Gandalf did say to Frodo, <laughs> <laughs> "This is riddles in the dark, uh, chapter, you know, whatever of the <laughs> Hobbit." Uh, just, and you're doing the Golem voice and the Hobbit voice. You're going back and forth. <laughs> you're my prey. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Family just totally like doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> Oh, funerals are such somber things too that like it's I don't know I always every time someone breathes a little bit of comedy into it I think everybody like being sad and laughing are very close I find in like the emotional spectrum so like I've been like I have my great uh, my grand well technically he's my step grandfather he when he died um, you know that there's a funeral but I mean he was older and it was kind of expected but my uncle when he passed away he he died unexpectedly he was in a bit of an accident he was working on a car in his driver driveway and he had it propped up on like not correctly and it fell and, and crushed his uh his head yeah it's a rough way to go so uh, i remember at the funeral for that it was just such a tragic thing and his kids and everything that there's almost a part of you that's like just something to break the tension i guess you know the emotional tension of it so i would appreciate that you can certainly read all the <laughs> lord of the rings you want at my funeral awesome i'll do it assuming you live part, part of it for me it's funny because i was uh my son's getting older now so he was talking about like when i was a kid and stuff mm-hmm. and i was telling him, like when i was a kid uh in late elementary early junior high all i had in my bedroom was a small you know it's like a 10 inch black and white television with the rabbit ears on it mm-hmm. and it only had three stations it had pbs it had cdc and it had 
PBS, CTV. Well, you and PBS, you're better than me. <laughs> I had and, uh, CTV and ATV. That was it. The CBC <laughs> and, and ATV. PBS yeah. on Channel 4, it was. And I, and I spent a lot of time, I was supposed to be going to bed, and I put a blanket over my head so they wouldn't see the light of the TV. Yeah. And I'd watch a lot of these old British sitcoms and stuff in like junior high. It shows that I shouldn't have found funny, mm-hmm. but really did. You know, like, are you being served in Benny Hill? And Those are great. Things. Great shows. You know, they, they're great. They really, I think, because I started watching some of them, I turned on an episode on YouTube of Are You Being Served? Just to show him, and he didn't he completely always know it. He didn't get it, and it wasn't funny to him. Yeah. But as I'm watching, I'm like, oh, "Man, yeah, this is this is where I got my sense of humor." From. Yeah, well, British this comedy is, where is, is right here. <laughs> British comedy is fun in that it it like it's very silly, but it it hides some pretty dark humor sometimes. Like some of Monty oh, Python stuff is incredibly dark. Mm-hmm. You know, arguing with someone over a dead parrot or or those sort of things. Like, there's some interesting stuff there, uh, and and those shows like. Anything that um, John Cleese had done or any of those older shows. Like, I love British shows. The IT crowd is probably one of my favorite comedies. Yeah, time. IT crowd's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm, right now, I'm watching the uh, What We Do in the Shadows TV show. Have you seen any of that yet? Oh, The Vampire? I haven't watched yeah. the show yet, actually. It's really the good. The guy that played Mr. Renom's son, so the second Mr. Renom, Matt Barry, he's one of the oh, vampires yeah. in the show. And he's he so did good. another show a couple of years ago, probably a few years ago now. Uh, What's it called? Oh, uh, the Toast of London. Yeah, something? I watched it all on Netflix. <laughs> that show was amazing. That guy could do anything, and I would laugh hysterically <laughs> at everything he does. I remember the I posted recently on Facebook all the all the Clem Fandango uh, every <laughs> oh, single yeah, time. That's right. Yeah, that's... when he's in the the phone booth and he's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, what's his name? It was his last name was Toast. I can't remember his first name. Yeah, anyway, can can you hear me? He's, yes, Clem Fandango, I can hear you. And that guy's on uh, Star Trek Discovery, which is interesting. Yeah, I didn't even know that, actually. I watched all of Discovery Season 1, and then something came up, and I was a side-by-side picture of him. Mm. I was like, holy shit, that's the Fandango guy. Yeah, <laughs> no S. Tyler. <laughs> so I had to go back and rewatch it just to... Uh... <laughs> that's funny. Um, Steven Toast, there we go. It just stuck in Steven my head. Toast. Yeah. yeah, it's a good show. It was fun. Like, any of those British shows, even their serious stuff's great. Like, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay, so what did your, did your mom, was, did she have a job or was she minding the store while your dad was off being a minister? Um, sort of. She, she had jobs, but she had retail jobs. And the last job she had was at a uh, doctor's office as a receptionist. Really? Um, she really enjoyed that job. Um, but then my dad's health started getting bad. He couldn't really be left alone at home See, too how's long. How's he doing now? Is he so, still... She kind of retired early. I was going to do the quotation. She retired early. <laughs> Basically, she just didn't have a job for a while. She's at that age now where you can say she's retired. <laughs> sure. Is your father doing okay now, or is it sort of a steady decline? No. No, it's the same. He's, he's got all kinds of issues. <laughs> oh. Stemming from the hemophilia mainly? Or? Yeah, it all comes from that. Actually, he had a bit of a, a, a successful thing happen lately because he uh, because of the hemophilia, anytime he has a surgery or anything like that, he has mm-hmm. to go back to eight. And he, and he, so he clots when we operate on him. Mm-hmm. And back in the, the randy old 80s and early 90s, when they weren't really checking where they were getting the blood from, he ended up getting hepatitis C oh, uh, yeah. from one of his transfusions. And uh, so that, of course, that would cause a lot of problems too. Issues. But they now have a pill that you can take that has a pretty good uh, uh, success rate of clearing that out of you yeah no it's it's that that particular condition is quite fixable now i guess yeah so he he, he did the test he ran through it he did it and he was a couple months ago successful and it's going oh fantastic well, that's good name. congratulations yeah. maybe you know they say the lord works in mysterious ways so. that's right <laughs> That's, I find it very interesting that you, that like, it's a, almost like a war of attrition between you, between you and your father, but each trying to convert each other. Well, he's trying to like get you into, to religion and sort of some, trying to save your mortal soul. You're basically yeah. trying to convince him that nothing matters and you, you, you know, life is random. It doesn't mean anything and cool and heartless. He, he's pretty cool about it. He doesn't, uh, that's good. Like he's, he said he, he was never one to push it on us. No, I don't really like people that push their, like, as an atheist, I don't really like, I don't care if you believe in something, as long as you're not trying to convert me or, or, no. you know, 
doing and using it to do terrible things. I don't mind. You can believe yeah. what you want, you know. And to be honest with you, like in the early years when we first started, so that was like junior high, so maybe in high school, I guess, who was officially kind of like doing some of the churches and stuff. And so we would go, not every so my mom went to pretty much every service, but my brother and I would just go to random ones. And he was quite good at what he did. And I did question it for a while, like, you know, because I did see, I saw the good in the churches at the time, mm -hmm. um, helping the community and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, no problem but with that. now I'm like, you know, you can help the community without that as your background. I mean, be nice to people and feed the hungry, you know, yeah. or whatever. Well, my, um, I, I read The God Delusion a while, like a few years ago, and I, I always sort of like flip-flopped. I never really, it's always something like going through religion classes when I was a kid that I, I remember looking at it saying like, you know, this doesn't sound right. You know, like when the teacher was like, well, gay people are, are going to hell and animals don't have souls or just here to make our lives better. And I'm like, that seems like, <laughs> that seems like a lot of uh, backflip reasoning to explain the horrible ways we treat each other and animals and the planet. So I was yeah. kind of like checking out at that point. But then after I read that book, I was just sort of like, well, you know, to put it really into perspective and be like, yeah, I, I buy all that. Um, I love that argument that like religion's what makes people good. Like, like, or, yeah. or like, I was like, like if you're living in a society where everybody is only kept in check by the fact that they might get punished for doing something horrible, what kind of world are we living in? Like, we're all just, yeah. we're all just one, one jail sentence away from becoming a rapist or a murderer because you know, that's the only thing stopping you. Like, how horrifying would it be to know your neighbor would just, like, do the most horrible things possible to you if he wasn't going to be punished? The only yeah. thing keeping him in check is is some and kind of punishment. Let's face it, too, because right now there's a lot of religious people who are doing horrible things. So, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not the right uh, argument, I guess. I do remember in high school, I had to go back an extra year in high school because mm -hmm. I was, believe it or not, a terrible student. And uh, I, I had to go back for a credit. <laughs> Didn't matter what it was. I always like to point this out so people don't think I'm just a complete idiot. I had my sciences, I had my math, I had my English, but I was missing a credit. So, so did I you just said, not pass a class, or I, you... just didn't I actually failed economics, and I, oh. <laughs> that's a whole other story. But I failed <laughs> economics, so I had to go back. I could have gone to summer school, but I was like, I'm not going to waste my summer, you know, going to school. <laughs> so going. Go so going to a full year of school after that for one credit or half a year was, was better yeah, too? Yeah, I, I had no plans. I was like, whatever. And I knew some of my friends were going back to upgrade and stuff. So it's okay. going to be kind of a party year. I convinced the guidance counselor. I'm getting off topic now. But I convinced oh, the guidance counselors that uh, to allow me to take all three years of art over again. You know, I passed them and everything so that I could work on a portfolio for NASCAD. Oh. But, I knew, but I knew I wasn't going to NASCAD. I knew that it wasn't my cup of tea and I hated school so much. I was like, I'm not going to pay to go to school. Even if it's for something I'm doing, I'm not going to pay to go. Because I'm not that person to sit in a room and listen to people growing on. About stuff. Anyways, that aside, so I took three years of art over again and I took uh, sociology and religious studies as my other two classes to get my one credit to graduate. Because I figured I work on sociology, but if I'm failing that, I'm taking religious studies. My dad can help me with that, and everything will be fine. And I ended up passing both of them, so I graduated with an extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, but I do remember sitting in the front of the class in religious studies, and there was a bunch of people. Like I did take an interest in it because I wanted to understand it a little bit more and stuff. And there's other people that were just there to get their credit, and, but there was also the very Catholic people that were there, and they, they were stuff. yeah. My sort of end of the year project or whatever, and it's like the whole thesis, if you will, was based on the idea that people are only religious because it makes them feel better about dying. <laughs> that <laughs> it, that that sounds like a good topic to me because that's, in my opinion, that's uh, that's one of the biggest ones. I I always said to one one of my friends sort of pointed this out to me one time. So it's probably the the, the best quote I've ever had in my life. So. So I added my book title to go with yours. I said, um, I said, with people, it's never about what's right or what's wrong consciously, usually. It's about what's easy. And uh, religion is easy. Like, yeah. here's a book. You follow it. You're going to make it to grand reward afterwards. But I think, you know, life's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. 100%. Anything that comes to the guidebooks usually a little easier than trying to figure it out yourself. So. Yeah, exactly.
It, uh, yeah, no, de- fear of death is, or what's going to happen to you is probably the the biggest one, you know. Yeah. Maybe dead. I figure if they answer two questions, religion will go away. And yep. then people will find other reasons to hate people. Um, <laughs> well, skin color seems popular right now. I'm sure color, the human whatever. race seems to be ready to hate people for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I figure once we figure out. To be clear, I don't think we're ever going to find out the answers of these ones. Maybe one of them, but I don't think. One, how did life actually start on the planet Earth? Mm-hmm. And what happens to us after we die? Yeah. Now, I don't think we'll truly ever answer the second one. Mm-hmm. Though, I have my faith that <laughs> when you're dead, it's black and worms eat you. Mm-hmm. Uh, first one, maybe. Maybe something will happen. It's like, Eureka, we figured out how life actually started on this earth. This is how it actually started. The biggest stumbling block I have, uh, I just hate, it's not even so much that I can't accept that you're right, that you're probably right, that's what it is. Uh, it's that I hate the idea that me as a person just is done. It just ceases. It's over. Um, mm-hmm. I know matter, you know, energy doesn't just change its forms. It doesn't go away. So what makes me up is going to go on to become something else. Whether I'm a conscious being or whatever, who knows? But the, just the idea that every, all my experiences, everything I am, is just gone. It's just really, yeah, exactly, dust in the wind. It's just a, it's just a sad. To me, it's that's the most when faced with the concept of death. That's what bothers me the most. But uh, I'm also very. Um, I can't think of the correct term. Uh, clinically minded in that, you know, I'm also my my life, general life philosophy is like, what are you gonna do? So I literally, unless I become a vampire tomorrow somehow, or gain mm-hmm. immortality, or you know, there's nothing really you can do about it. So you can either rant and rave about the inevitable, or just accept it. Really, that's all you can do. I like that. I just, I'm comfortable with that. I know it's gonna come. <laughs> you sound almost too comfortable with it, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Death comes. I feel like if you have that feeling, like I feel it's the argument you have to have, where it's like if you feel like when you die, nothing's going to happen. Mm. You kind of got to be comfortable with that. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. I think other people are like, well, don't you want to go off and see all your friends and family that have passed away? And like, of course, I would love to walk into a room and all the friends that have died and all the family died were in that room and had a giant party. With me. But I don't think it's going to actually happen. So I just have to be as comfortable with the idea. Of if not more, then when I'm dead, I'm just gone. And yeah. my life is only going to be as long as the people who remember me. So my son and his kids. And, but after that, yeah, I'll be dust in the wind. As you put <laughs> well, you could just do something really, uh, really horrible or really cool and be remembered by everybody. Yeah. I'd suggest going with the cool thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hitler will probably be remembered for a very long time, but not for a good reason. Yeah, sure. I had this. I had a. He comes comment. up a lot lately, eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He certainly has been referenced quite a bit in the media as of late. Um, I know we've kind of gone off. We'll get back to to uh, to, to, to the life of Andrew Clark, but uh, the yeah the oh my brain. Um, anyway, yeah, no the, the, that uh, that that I can get behind that concept. I had this ta- conversation with a friend before that. Like, what would you do if, I, I, I think if we were just drinking or something and we we're just trying to talk and coming up with fun stuff to discuss. And I was like, say you were, you have indescribable proof that the only way you, like you're, you'll go to an afterlife or you'll live longer forever, your spirit remains if people remember you. And you find this out like the day before you know you're going to die. But nobody knows you now. You're just a random dude. Like, would the onus on you be to go do something in the span of a day, really horrible or really good? Like, what do you think would be, would get you remembered the most? That's amazing. That's a really good question. So yeah, like, like, you, like you become like a ghost or an angel or something. Yeah. Let's say you go to heaven, but you're you forever. Sure. Your stance in heaven is higher depending on how well you're remembered. It doesn't so matter if it's for good or bad. Die, just we're basically the doormat of heaven. Yes. Okay. But <laughs> your popularity is what gets you in. Yeah, but like Norm Macdonald, let's say, he, he he's like the, the doorman. He lets you in and tells you where to go. Like, exactly. That's a really good question. I, know. I, like that. I don't know. Because, uh, you know, the, the bad seems to be remembered way more than the good. In the, hand, the span of people. Yeah, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, well, I could sell everything, sell my house and everything, and try to feed a bunch of hungry people. You know, to try yeah, to but you That's only going to last so long, because yeah, Drake's exactly. more money than I do, and he feeds way more people than I do. <laughs> 
Anyway, it's a thought experiment. I said, I said like a modern day famous person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my son's rubbing off on me. Uh, how old's your son now? He's 10. Oh, well, it must be a fun age. Is your, uh, do you have any interest in religion or any of that stuff? He is. My wife believes in, in, in it. Um, she's not, she doesn't go to church very often. She does it every once in a while. He has gone with her. He does, uh, he believes in God. Mm-hmm. Um, Are you trying to convert him as well now? Or? <laughs> uh, he, well, he knows exactly how I feel, on it, and I do make comments. I'm He's like, "Come here, he's come here, son. Your, your, when your mom's out of your shot, you know. Yeah, no, no, like I, someday you're gonna die, and you're not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> you're just gonna <laughs> rot the ground, and worms are gonna eat you." <laughs> I, I do, I do, I do make because he he knows uh, about you know the Santa Claus, and he knows it's not real and stuff. And I'm not no spoiler alert there for you. But he, you know, <laughs> This is breaking news. Me. Breaking news in the graphic history podcast. <laughs> like, like you know, Santa's not real, and the Easter Bunny's not real, and the Tooth Fairy's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> yeah, it's like a hierarchy thing, I guess. The guy at the top could could maybe rule. Yeah, the guy at the top, he's he's making it happen. Yeah, well, I think people find comfort. I mean, the after death part's a big one, but uh, I once heard an Alan Moore quote where he said. Uh, that like conspiracy theorists only, and I kind of attribute the same thing to religion. Like, and we're certainly seeing a, a, a ton of conspiracy theorists online and in the world now with all their trumped up ideas about, no pun intended, uh, about, you know, why things are the way they are. Uh, but he said conspiracy theorists believe in a conspiracy because it's more comforting to know that somebody's in charge than to accept the horrifying truth that nobody's in charge. And it's just, we're all rudderless, just kind of randomly trying to figure things out. We're going through things. And I think that's true. I think there's comfort in knowing, even if it's for nefarious reasons, somebody knows what's really going on. Yeah, and okay. accepting the cosmic horror behind it all, that nobody knows what's going on. It's all totally random, sometimes cold and dark, and sometimes fun and light. But mm-hmm. that's, that's random. Like, to me, I find it more comforting to know that. Because then when terrible things happen, you have no one to blame. You can't say, you know, God's testing me or, or that guy messed, you know, whatever. It's just, this is the universe. It's, it's random <laughs> and, un, and unfeeling sometimes. It is random. And I, I always, I really always just like the idea that God's also used as not really the reward, but the reason for the good stuff. So like, you know, sick child's in the hospital, you know, it gets better. And the mom's like, I prayed for him every day, and God saw on us that he was going to. God yeah. wasn't there. You know, there's like seven and a half billion people in the world or something like that. Yeah. I think God was hanging out with your kid at the hospital. No offense, I'm sure your kid's great. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the a lot kid, worse shit going on in the world. <laughs> the kid born in a third world country with AIDS that has like a three day <laughs> lifespan and dies in misery. Like, was, was that God? Is God hanging out with them too? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what about that kid that did die down the hallway? Like, yeah, the, yeah. No, he just didn't want it. must have been a prostitute or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. His mom just didn't want it enough she didn't pray hard enough, enough. <laughs> it's, uh, like it's it's easy but you know yeah faith it's all part of the plan it's all, faith. It's all part of the plan but okay so uh when did uh what what happened after high school where'd you go from there uh after high school with that extra credit that extra credit it made me uh, <laughs> I, I created a company called apple Oh, uh, wow. That credit, so. I, I, I sold it uh, <laughs> yeah. for, it. Three, for $300. There's actually, you want to hear talking about fate and how cruel life can be. Look up about the guy that was like Steve Jobs' partner or something. There was like three people invested in Apple, not just the two originally. And the third guy, like when things were like a little rocky, pulled out and for his investment for a few thousand dollars and just like and, and went away. And like, man, can you think about regret in your life? And now he's a janitor. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, a sanitary engineer. <laughs> Is that the term? My mother's the sanitary engineer, so. I think that's what it's called. Oh, okay. I'll have to tell her that. Uh, after high school, so I, I, it's a bit of a blur after high school. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going through some stuff. Uh, what kind of stuff? stuff so I, I was drinking quite heavily. Okay. Uh, so just living it up? There was, you weren't like getting away from something or like you're just partying? Because you're free? I, or? I was partying. I mean, hindsight being what it is now that I'm an old wise man. 
uh, I had a friend who had died uh, in a car accident uh, in Ontario, but he had gone to school. He moved up there to be a paramedic. He was in a car accident. And after he died, we, uh, I said, we, me and my friends, uh, we got really close and a couple of us moved in together. And we basically ended up just being downtown Wednesday to Sunday, mm -hmm. uh, drinking and partying and having a good time and doing what the kids do. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really, it got really bad. It kind of encompassed my life a little bit. I always hesitate. I wasn't an alcoholic. I really wasn't an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I just, I could quit. I just didn't know that I should quit. <laughs> and, was and, it part uh, of the pain of losing your friend? Like, was that sort of numbing you to yeah, it? Yeah, looking back, it's, it was our way of, like, dealing with the grief of it. Because it hit me hard. He was the first first person in my life that died. And I, just I was going to say, it could be that, that kind of idea that when you're first faced with death, like that you can't avoid you I mean you're, you're aware of it as a kid you know, pets and whatever but when you know somebody and suddenly they're gone that yeah maybe... it was like, like he wasn't sick or anything it just all we just got a phone yeah. call from his mother and you know, it, it really changed the course of everything at that point because it was mm -hmm. just all about hanging like, everything was just really hanging like well, it gives you the onus to want to or the, the desire to want to live your life as, as you know, as fun as you can because you kind exactly, of face with yeah. the idea that it might end soon or, or it will end someday and you might as well enjoy it, right? Yeah. I can understand that. I had a friend that died when I was mm -hmm. in high school. So, uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't go that route probably because I wasn't much of a drinker in high school and I, I developed in college, but... Uh, yeah, it's probably when it happened that it kind of like the two core, because we were drinking and going downtown mm -hmm. anyway, but then it really became a thing. You know? Yeah. I remember, you know, on Saturday, because we, we were closed on Sunday, so nobody had to work on Sunday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So Saturday night's like, I drink a quarter right and a case of beer and then go downtown. Nice. I mean, I can't do it. I how mean, well I did you it. walk downtown? <laughs> what was that? How well did you walk downtown? Oh, I was, I mean, what's in your system all the time? It's fine. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. <laughs> it's when you stop yeah. drinking and try to do that again, that is the problem. <laughs> ah, well, that's the key. You don't stop. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the key. You don't stop. But I mean, I get a quarter ride now at Christmas time that lasts me the whole year. So I, mean, I couldn't even imagine sitting down with a whole quarter ride at this point in one night. But yeah, so, so that happened. And then uh, there was kind of a wake up call and I was able to act. And, and uh, at that point, I was working at the, the store that I was working at, Mr. Big and Tall. And then just decided I was going to work hard and become manager of that store because, and I quote, if this is the job I'm going to have for the rest of my life, I think I can do it. It's a pretty cool job. And it lasted about 20 years. <laughs> I was going to say, you were, I've known you for probably 10 now, maybe yeah. around that. And uh, you were working there when I met you. So. Yeah. I started there in 98. Wow. Yeah. And went on to be manager. Yeah. And then I had enough of that. Yeah. So was there uh we'll, get, we'll circle back to that. Um, so when did the comic stuff work? Were you always a comic fan? Yeah, no. <laughs> like, I, I've always been a drawing fan. I always uh -huh. was doodling or drawing, and but I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any immediate friends that were into comics and like elementary, junior high type of thing. Um, and growing up uh, younger than that, so early elementary, maybe late elementary, GI Joe was like my go-to thing. I love GI Joe. But everything about GI Joe. And I would draw the real good characters and stuff. And um, um, I remember he was in junior high, Brandon Ferguson, who was a friend of mine, brought an incredible Hulk comic to school one day because I was hanging out with cool kids. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, sounds like my, <laughs> my cool kid friends in high school. Yeah. And uh, I remember it was, uh, it was one of the issues that took place between. Uh, Dumb Hulk and then Dale Keown to go over uh, to do Smart Hulk. Right. And art, I'm talking artists here. I'm all with the artists. I don't remember who like well, that. That would have been and, Peter David's run, I think, wouldn't it have? Because Peter David's the one who brought in the Smart Hulk, when did he not? That's, yes, you're right. And, and Dale Keown was doing the art. And uh, anyways, but it was a sort of standalone issue in between. And it was Gray Hulk. I don't remember. I can't remember why exactly this was a weird standalone issue in between, but uh, the Rhino was in. Okay. And the rhino was dressed as Santa Claus on the cover, and him and the Gray Hawk were fighting each other. And 
Rhino said something about, you know, being a big gray hawk or whatever, and the hawk saying, hey, I represent that remark or whatever. Anyways, I'm getting the details all screwed mm-hmm. up. But I was like, wow, that's really cool. Like, this is what I've been doodling all this time. I just didn't know it. So I went to to a local corner store when you buy comics at the corner store. I worked and, in one of those when I was in high school. <laughs> and I bought they had, had G.I. Joe comics, and, and that's what I had known. So I just started buying the G.I. Joe comic books. At that. Did you have it a chance to a while meet? to get into the superhero books. Yeah. Um, so I, I probably only collected G.I. Joe for the longest time before I actually started getting into it. The superhero ones and stuff like that. Did you have a chance to meet Larry Hama? Like he did all those comics, I, right? I, he, he was at Halcon. I met Larry Hama at Halcon. Yeah. And it was either the first or second one I had gone to be the guest at. I felt so bad for him. Everyone else has a different uh, memory about this, but I remember him sitting there and not having that many people coming up to him. Mm-hmm. And I was so nervous at that point because my first two Halcons were a mess because I just didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And I went up to say hello to him. Um, but one of the tragedies of my life, all those G.I. Joe comic books disappeared from me. I'm, you know, it's funny because they have boxes of comic books. I know what happened to them now, sort of. Your mom threw them out? That's usually the classic story. No, uh, it, it's funny. <laughs> I get off topic a lot. It's all right. No, it's all right. It's good, man. So, it's about you. So, <laughs> uh, so my. I really kind of got away when I talking about my friend who died and everything. I really yeah. got away from her and I got away from comics all together. Mm-hmm. When the sort of dust settled and I was getting back into it and I started collecting books again. Um, I was like, what the hell happened to all these G.I.J. comics? I didn't know. And I remember going to my parents' place and I got up into the attic one time and I looked into the attic and my mom swore up and down. She did not throw them out and, and I believe her and, and uh, I said, we lived with my dad's mom. Uh, her and I did not get together, so it was a card with her. Maybe she threw them out, maybe, because she hated me, and I wasn't a big fan of her. And, and uh, so it was just one of those things. And I would, just, and I would go through my collection sometimes and just be like, maybe I'm missing this giant section of you know, G.I. Joe comic books. I look through them, and I don't see them. Maybe this time I'll see them. I don't know. they got to be somewhere. Mm-hmm. And then uh, my parents sold their house. And when they're having their sort of like moving out party, if you will, I'm sitting there and there's a bunch of family around and I have a cousin who's younger than I am. He's the baby sitting there from time to time. And he just chits and he goes, I remember when you gave me that bag with G.I. Joe Palmer. Oh. <laughs> what? You have them? He's like, well, I don't have them anymore. He said, uh, my mom might have them at her house. And I contacted her twice just to see, like, yeah. you know, maybe they're in the bag in the basement or something. But yeah. nobody seems to know where that bag of comics uh, is. But I did, at least, I, at least I, I have some closure. I know it. <laughs> well, there's two things I want to cycle back to. Uh, one, the that's funny because I was that cousin one time. Like, my, my cousin Chad gave me a bunch of comics when I was a kid. They're a bunch of old She-Hulk comics, John Byrne's She-Hulk run. Which I love. They're putting out an omnibus of it soon, which I'm really excited for. Right. It's his, so his whole run on She-Hulk. Uh, all that fourth wall breaking sort of fun. But anyway, he was asking me one day, he's like, he's like, yo, do you still have all those comics I gave you? And I was like, yeah, the She-Hulk ones, I think I still got somewhere. And he was like, oh, no, I gave you like Infinity Gauntlet number one and all this stuff. And I was like, you most certainly did not. And he's like, <laughs> like, oh, because his parents' house burned down. So anything that was in there is, is gone. So he was like convinced that I might have had them, and I was like, you know, certainly I do not. Uh, you know, I got some She-Hulk comics from you, but that was about it. But you know, and I still have them, so I guess I'm the good cousin in the way that if you wanted them back, but I don't think there's as much value or sentimental to him or or as the uh, as those comes to be. So you yeah, say you didn't get along with your you didn't get along with your your grandmother? No, we did not get along. Why? Why not? She she was my nemesis. <laughs> Actually, the only the only thing I will say about the the benefit of her as a person. I guess oh, wow. Two okay. This is only, only two redeeming qualities. She in two redeeming family. one. She gave me my dad. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> right? good. Without him, I wouldn't be here. That's, that's good. Uh, so I have to accept that. Yes. And two, she gave me a really strong understanding of the words love and hate. Hmm. And, I, and I despise when people say things like, I hate this person or I hate this or I hate that. 
You, know, you don't know what hate is. You really don't. I hated my grandma. Really? <laughs> she was a passion, and I understand. And that feeling that I had for her, I've never had for anybody else. I, really? I, there's people I don't like, and there's people I don't want to hang out with. And I, I truly understand what love and hate is now because of her. So she gave me that sort of clarity. Of the world. I truly understand what the word hate really means. <laughs> why, 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 did you, why did you hate her for the, for the time? Ah, she was just, uh, there was just so many things. She was just not a nice person, I guess is the best way. Really? Like, was she like a bully to you of, of sorts? Or? She was a bully to pretty much everybody. She was, she was just hateful to be hateful. I remember one day I was sitting in the living room for and just watching TV. And she was there in the living room, but I'd ignore her. And there was a, a, a girl. We lived in the north in the Halifax. Yeah. And uh, there was a girl of uh, African descent, if you will, was walking down the street. I don't know who she is, no idea. She was minding her own business. She was just walking down the street. And she looked out the window laughing and said, ha, 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 there goes your girlfriend. Yeah. And I was like, I looked at the girl, I got up, I looked at the window, and I looked at the girl, I was like, man, I wish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I went right yeah, yeah. But that's just a, just a small, like, just out of the blue, she did that for no particular reason. I'm talking to her, the girl wow. was minding the business. Very topical, too, for what's going on right now. It makes you wonder what is so broken in some people. Like, I know people gloss over that old, it's like the old way of thinking, or like they're from a different time. And I feel like in today's world, that's not an acceptable excuse for anybody, really. I don't care how old you are, and I don't care, you know, I don't care where you grew up. I mean, with the information available to you now, to the world, and what you've seen through your life, hopefully something, you're not locked in a dungeon somewhere. You, you'll know that, that stuff like that, it, it bothers me whenever I run into that too. I had an elderly relative and I guess for the sake of my family, I won't name them. But one time we were going down, uh, going, uh, we're driving somewhere and um, she looked out the window at a couple walking up the street and it was a black man and a, and a white woman. And she said, I don't like seeing that. And I was like, and I remember I was probably like 11 or 12 and I remember going, Oh, like, like just something in me realized because you, you think the best of your relatives until you're kind of, faced with something like that and then you're like oh no you know like and then you kind of that is around that age you kind of kind of grips with like that concept that people are complicated you can like someone and not necessarily agree uh with with some really horrible shit that they might they might say yeah actually, that's true because i remember i have a or i had uh my great grandmother uh muriel uh, so that that your grandmother's mother she was no she's on my mother's side okay um, so she's gonna was say, is there like a school. litany of hate passed down through the? No, no, actually, I, I loved my great grandmother. She was right, amazing. Cool. She was like, she was the grandmother to me. Oh yeah, well, that's uh, cool. she Could was you young have enough. That? She was young enough that because my family has had a history of getting pregnant early, hmm. that I had a great grandmother in my life. But she was still young enough that we'd hang out. As a matter of fact, one of the first things I did with my now wife and her and were starting to date and go out. I took her to the old age home where my great grandmother was staying in, and we hung out in the lobby with her and her friends where they were playing bridge and stuff. And I was like, I was like "You just got to meet this woman. She's an That's amazing." That's really person. sweet. That's super yeah. sweet. I'm a pretty sweet fellow. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do remember distinctly one time my mom and I were visiting her, and she used a uh, not uh, uh, not a flattering word to describe uh, people of African descent. Uh -huh. uh, it wasn't the big one. It was another one. Yeah. And like I said, they're all, they're all pretty bad. <laughs> they're all bad. But yes, I, I know. I know what you mean. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't even know what it meant at the time when she yeah. said it. And she wasn't saying like all these dang people. She was just yeah. saying, oh, this person. Yeah. And it, when it's casually it. dropped like that, it's even more disturbing. Because not oh. even like they have an angry way. It's just, it's so ingrained in the vocabulary that it doesn't even, they don't even realize they just said something atrocious. It just. Yep. Yeah. It's part of the everyday top vernacular. You know, this is... And I remember saying to my mom, we got out to the car, I was like, what did she mean by this word? And, and my mom was like, don't say that word out loud. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I know, that's fine, but why was it? And then she had to explain it, and I was like, no. Oh. She said that? And she's like, yeah, she's, like, she's old. She doesn't know anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, this was like 
20 years ago now at this point. So. <laughs> it's so funny. Like, do you think, where, where is that going to stop? Like, when we're old, or is, is it going to be fine for one of our contemporaries to say that and then their grandkids would gloss over it? Like, is it just society for when they were there? It's okay. Like, it just, I just don't, I, I find a hard time. Uh, you know what? It. I think it has everything to do with uh, their parents passage of time and yeah. I think there's more people now who are uh, more enlightened I hope like, so I, I'm not I, I have I don't know when people are watching this but this is Black O2 they did it with recordings and it's, it's hard for me because I don't really know the right things to say mm -hmm. you know obviously I'm against it and against racism and you know yes Black Lives Matter um, but it's funny because I feel like to me, like I did the black open on Instagram. Yeah. And, I, and I'm like, oh, is that what that is? Like, I, I did not know that's what people were doing. I've noticed that the people have blacked out their profiles. Yeah, and I had no idea. Tuesday. Yeah, I yeah, had no just, idea. I missed the boat well, of that. Apparently, it's not something that's supported by Black Lives Matter. And I didn't oh. know. And I just, I was like, well, you know what? I'm in solidarity. Let's do this. But then I found out later on, halfway through the day, that it's. You know, it's just people doing it. It's not really a thing. And I'm like, well, I'm not taking it down now. So I had to write a little blurb about it on my Facebook. Mm -hmm. like, but I don't feel like I'm not the guy to speak up like this. Like, I'll tell you, yeah, yeah, don't hate black people. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. But there's better people out there who are going to explain it who are facing it every day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know and if I the feel world. Like our children, my children, like he's the most enlightened person in my life yeah and we, 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 we talked to him uh, at nauseam about everything like you know he's so okay with transgender people yep he's yeah. also and i actually remember we were watching um it's probably about you know, six months ago it doesn't really matter. a while ago we were watching mm -hmm. this uh, thing on netflix it was uh monty python and it was you know they're the best bits monty python mm -hmm. and can't remember his name, but he's a comedian. He's, he's from the UK. Is he one of the Pythons? No, no, he was just one of the guys. Like, this is my favorite part. Of oh, I see. Okay. Oh, Ed, Eddie Izzard, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie yeah, Izzard. He was yeah. wearing, like, he had on lipstick and eyeshadow, but he was yeah. wearing, I think it's just his regular suit. Mm -hmm. And he had his fingers done. And he's talking. And me, as a 44 year old man, I'm watching it, and he comes on. And my sort of, like, old brain looks at it i don't say anything mm -hmm. but it, you know it just triggers something in my brain that i noticed that he's wearing it yes i looked over at my son who's 10 years old and i feel like should have questioned what he was watching mm -hmm. but did, didn't really? even cross his mind wow. that this guy was wearing makeup and hair and everything just didn't I... phase him at all and i remember i was thinking that's the future though. Just letting uh, this guy be this guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. I always say that the the biggest issue most with society, in my opinion, is too many people care too much about things that have nothing to do with them. Why do you care what someone else is wearing? Why do you care who wants to sleep with who? Why do you care it has nothing to do with you, you know? It, you can go about your life and not engage with it if you don't want to. But I, I really do think that you're onto something with that idea that, that, like, I don't know if a massive revolution where, you know, we hang the racists in the streets is going to be is is going to be the right answer i think it's going to be a quieter way in which hopefully through generations and and i i i it's kind of not optimistic to think that it's going to take that much time but but you know i'd like to think that maybe we get equality sooner but hopefully through the proper parenting and like we all don't have to get in a soapbox and yell from the rooftops about the change needs to happen but all it takes is just saying something when you see something wrong you know and that's and a lot of people don't even bother doing that sort of thing. So uh -huh. a friend of mine actually just told me the other day, he's actually like, I was, I, I have huge respect for him, but he works at a store and a guy came in that was like drunk one night with his girlfriend and he was just going off against um, the cab driver who was probably of Middle Eastern descent saying some pretty derogative terms about it over and over again. He walked up to the counter and said something to him about it. And uh, he said, you should be ashamed of yourself. And And I was like, I said, dude, like it, it amazes me. So many people would say nothing, just ring the guy's order through and, and let him go about his day. But like, it means a lot to know, like he's a great guy. And I was just super impressed with, 
with that he would just go out of his way to actually call someone out in their garbage like that. And it, I wish more people were like that. It's a trade. I wish I, I did more often. I don't really, and I don't think I, I'm not putting those situations a lot. I mean, obviously working with the public like he does, he probably um, would see more of that than I would. Cause I, obviously your friends are the people that, you know, are, have likewise mindset of you. So you're probably not getting into that. With them. But uh but on the internet, there's so much of it, and I don't, I just don't engage. I don't think, I don't think anybody's mind's ever been changed on Facebook ever. I don't think anything ever. And there's studies that show that even shown evidence to like a conflicting thing you believe in, people just double down on it, even if they know that they're wrong, because there's something. It's the same thing in your brain that says you have to run when you're being physically attacked or fight, fight or flight response. It's that, that same thing gets triggered when like you're confronted with evidence against something that you you believe in. It's like your brain just doesn't won't accept it, and yeah. uh, some people can't can't turn that part of it off or accept that that's a fact and just double down on that sort of stuff. So I don't really don't engage in social media. I, I, I think there's a level of uh, humility people have to have to be able to change or admit they're wrong, which people can't do. Like they God, can't it's, do. it's hard. I know, like just even me, like I, I'm not proud of it or anything, but you know, growing up, things were different. Yeah, like I, I grew up in Clayton Park, Fairview, and it was mm-hmm. predominantly white. Mm-hmm. And I can easily say, yes, I had no issues with anybody. Um, but I still made my jokes and said my things, yeah. not out of tape, but just because I thought it was funny. And yeah, thought yeah. everybody, ah, I'm enlightened, so I can make this joke. Yeah, because I don't actually mean anything by it. And as you get older and see that you know what it's probably not my thing to say whether i'm enlightened about this or not no probably (laughs) not i think it's i think it's uh i think even just that even even being enlightened and not feeling those words behind or that the those feelings behind the things you say to be funny or whatever it still kind of normalizes it in a way that like makes it sort of acceptable even even like i'm in the wrestling circles guys who crack jokes sometimes around some of the other black wrestlers and because I think it's funny and they, and I don't think they actually carry that sort of hate in their heart, but I never do it because I, I feel like even if the guy that they're kind of making the joke at is joking along with them, there might be a part of him that is just doing it to be accepted and doesn't necessarily believe it, you mm-hmm. know, because I don't, I don't want to normalize this sort of speech or make it okay to just sort of perpetrate that because somebody somewhere is being hurt by it. Not exactly. For sure. Well, I think that just comes with age too. And paying attention and learning things from people and realizing, you know what, maybe my thoughts aren't the most important thoughts in the world. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a very humbling and uh, I think healthy way to look at it. Mm. So when did the comics, so you were doing the comics, you got into the big and tall story, imagine that. Um, when did, was Adam the first thing like for getting into drawing comics or writing? No. And drawing? Uh, the very first thing I ever did actually was a, a comic I created called Crew One, and it was very uh, convoluted. Crew One? Crew One. Oh, Crew, crew okay. Yep. Crew One. Uh, and the basic was a team-oriented superhero comic. Um, it was very convoluted, very confusing. Uh, I overthought it, and I didn't have the ability to actually write it out properly, so it was crap. And, <laughs> and I had not honed my skill yet, and I was probably... I say ju- or high school maybe or just after high school that I did that. And I was very proud. I was proud of it at the time. I thought it was amazing. I thought it was going to skyrocket and into a comic book fandom. <laughs> and uh, and I took it to Strange Adventures in its own location on uh, Sackville Drive. Sackville, Sackville Street? Street, I mean. Yeah. Up by Night Magic there. Where that used yeah, to yeah, yeah. Night Magic. Anyway. And I uh, went in to see Callum and I sold him a few issues. And I was so nervous because up to that point, I was drawing these things in my room, mm-hmm. not really showing anyone but my parents and friends and stuff. It was the first time I was like, hey, here's a product. I want to sell it. And I all of a sudden got very, uh, very uh, nervous. And I went in. He bought how many issues for like 20 bucks. I'm so happy I made my $20, you know. And uh, God bless Cal. Seriously, yeah, he's one of the nicest and people. I, I, I never went back, and on the back cover, it was like, you know, in 30 days, issue two. <laughs> and, and I had a cover for issue two, and I never went back to see how it was sold. It sounded like mine. When I did Humbug, I did the same thing. I made an issue one, left it on a bit of a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> 
Cal bought a bunch for me and I felt like, you know, Hey, maybe I have a shot at this. And, yeah. uh, and then, you know, then I eventually found out that some other writer was doing the same thing, like shortly <laughs> after mine. So I, I gave my comic out to a lot of people at like comic conventions in Montreal and stuff. And I'm convinced that maybe he got a copy, this guy got a copy of it and had better connections than me to get like a, a deal with, with, it's not with any big, big company, but it's in diamond. So I definitely, go. yeah. I do, I do remember like the original, I don't remember why, but I ended up changing some of the dialogue on the first couple of pages. Mm-hmm. And it was all done by photocopier, and I, I did the word bubbles and cut them out on paper and taped them to the page. And, and you can actually see some of the old word bubbles underneath. The oh, through the photocopy? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, like, I don't remember why I changed the story. It didn't make it any better, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Because <laughs> I actually just read it recently. I just found copies of it. I love looking through those old, like I have a lot of those artist editions. I love looking through where the artists photocopy over the old ones and like, or, or they just marks or they're white out or just the different things that get hidden or, or fixed yep. up. I love that stuff. stuff too. I love seeing like the mistakes. When I, when I do commissions for people, sometimes there will be a mistake or a mark or something. Yeah. And I leave it there because to me it adds value to it. The fact that it's not a print, it hasn't been cleaned up for your, for you, type yeah. of thing. It's just what it is. Um, so I did that, and then I worked for a company in the city called Ray of Halifax. Uh, we built mascots and stuff. So I've been designing mascots for more since '99, I think. Really? Uh, we, That's pretty we cool. Called the head, the head mascot designer. Or you no, are I'm the head of the art department. What so what? What mascots have you designed? Uh, so most do they of build the, the suits and do everything? Mm-hmm. Like. Do they build the suits and do that whole thing? Yeah, I just design it. He goes to the clients and he finds out what it is they're looking for. And I usually draw like three levels and looking around to see if I have anything to show you. Um, but um, <laughs> this is only audio, isn't it? So no one's gonna it is. But we can, we can show a picture of it on, on the social media for sure. Um, so, yeah, we usually do three to four levels. So, like, we call it the bag suits, the first one. It's just like a head on it loose body mm-hmm. and then it builds up to more sculpted and, and more detail and stuff and then they, he takes that back to the client and they decide what they want and, and, uh, and sometimes they need changes so they come to me and they that's cool. change it at the request and he he and his team build them that's very interesting and so that's kind of all i did for a long time uh, as far as art was concerned and then one day I went into uh, getting a haircut down on Lacewood uh, by the McDonald's there. There used to be a first choice or a top touch or something there. I think it's an M&M's meat market now. I don't remember. But, uh, I went to get my haircut. She's going to do a half an hour. I said, okay. I said, well, I'll be back. I do need to get my haircut. So I'm just going to go walk around. And at this point, I wasn't collecting comics anymore. Uh, but there was first... Uh, no, the, the second last game stop was uh, next door. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just went in, and at that point, he was still carrying comic books. Mm-hmm. And there was a, I don't remember which one it was, but there was a Dark Horse comic that I picked up and started going through. And they had a creator in contest. And for some odd reason, after all those years, I was just like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this thing. And I, I read what it said. And realized later on I should have taken notes too, or just bought the comic book and taken it. <laughs> oh, you didn't. <laughs> so just just, just, just like, going yeah. off memory for what the rules were. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and uh, in my head, they needed six pages uh, of a continuous story, and then I had to write out what the story was actually about. And I took uh, uh, an existing character from that old Crew One comic book. Mm-hmm. kind of fleshed him out a little bit and I was actually using him as a character in a game I was playing at time my friend called City of Heroes. Oh yeah, I played that. Yeah, it was an amazing game. So, so many hours in that thing. And uh, so I took that character and really fleshed him out and and did it. And then because I wasn't drawing a lot, it took me forever to do it. It took a long time to do six pages. Mm-hmm. Probably like it, it might have been months for me to do six pages, which just isn't cool, but I didn't know it then. Uh, so when it was all said and done, I, I went onto the web page and said, all right, let's get this submission thing figured out. And, um, 
but it turned out that they actually need 16 pages. Well, six oh, pages. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, uh, 16 pages. I was like, well, I'm going to put this aside because I don't know what the answers are right now for mm-hmm. me for this. And uh, it just so happened I had a friend who, uh, who uh, was moving back to Halifax from Toronto and he flew me up there to help pack up a new haul and we drove back in one night we one shot at it back in front of the house. Wow. It's a long drive. And then the good time was fun. Lots of laughing and absolutely nothing because we were just deprived of sleep and tired and just laughing all the time. Yeah. Um, but he had podcasts on. And I had never listened to a podcast. I didn't even know what a podcast was. I like a podcast on him. Okay. And put it on. And one of them was um, uh, the guys that did see the book from here, they had their own online comic books, you know, like online comics. And it, I was like, wow, they have comics online. Like, I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's what I'm Whole new do. world. Yeah, I know. I was like, whole new world. I said, screw it, screw the on, screw the uh, creator own contest. And I'm just going to do this on my own. Yeah. So I finished, I think, three issues, really hunkered down. I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And I did three issues. Is this Adam? Uh, no, this was called A Slice of Fate. Okay. Because uh, the character's name was Slice. Oh. <laughs> he had a sword. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's too many blades out there. You had to go for Slice this time? <laughs> yeah. I kind of retconned it a little bit later on, and I said that the reason his name was Slice was because he got his powers. He was from Scotland, like, back in the 1100s. Oh, so it's a Highlander he, thing. He was leaving to go to um, uh, visit a cousin or something who had... Uh, fisheries business going on fishing and just thought, oh come with me we can make lots of money and he had to walk there and he was going through and next thing you know, this portal opened up and this guy came through and he was all beaten and battered and he gave him this diamond in his hand and these alien things came out and attacked him and not not him he hid he was like go and go hide and he yeah. hid and so he's the green uh, land before he had a bunch of powers he was discovering he had powers it was kind of like the spider-man thing where like all of a sudden you know, he had to run from something. This is in 1100 Scotland? <laughs> is where this is at me? Yeah, yeah. He, this, okay. is, this, is, this is what happened. Right. And it, this is interesting because it leads to Adam. And uh, so it, I record it a little bit to say that the reason he's called Slice, because he wasn't called Slice in those early years, is because in this other, uh, there's a portal that he came through from a different planet, basically. Mm-hmm. I did like Highlander growing up. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds Highlanders. Also, Green Lantern is now. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit, it's a bit of a mix. <laughs> the source of the power was the diamond. It was an enchanted yeah. diamond. And it's whoever owned the diamond, it didn't, you didn't have to keep it on you or anything like that. As a matter of fact, most of the slices hid them. Oh, so uh, there's multiple slice. <laughs> there were multiple slices, uh, actually. Uh, and they evolved and they were given to the chosen one. And that's actually a record it later on to say that the slice was actually just. In their language just meant like the chosen one or something like that. Oh, so it's, it's an alien language. Better, this sounds, but... <laughs> sounds kind of like slice. Slice is so funny because it doesn't sound like a like a a slice doesn't sound like a, a brutal attack. It's like you know if you slice your hand on a knife, like oh I sliced my hand. <laughs> it's not like you know being stabbed or or you know dismembered or gutted or whatever any blade Neither. or scimitar or whatever <laughs> you know something. <laughs> <laughs> Names are hard to come up with these. Days. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, I think I think maybe a sidekick paper cut could have really had a good run. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm doing my best. Uh, anyway. okay. I don't mean I'm not trying to belittle it actually. No, no, I have I have lots. Do, of, I do it too actually. I have so lots of grown worthy stuff I did when I was a kid. Same I, thing. I wish I could go back and change it. I really do. Oh, it that's all right. Worth the time. Um. <laughs> anyways. So I got three issues done, and, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to put them up online now, and I got a web page going, and originally I was doing three pages a week, Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and my thought was, like, if I can just draw three pages a week, I'll never catch up to myself, because I'm three issues in, right? Yeah. And I kept that up for a long time. I actually ended up changing it to two pages, because I got uh, Google... Uh, Whatever that uh, algorithm thing is, to like look at when people are looking at your website and stuff. Uh-huh. And uh, I realized people were really going to it on Wednesdays and Fridays. Mm-hmm. 
So, as we know, if that's the case, why am I putting anything up on Monday? So, I just I changed it down to Wednesday to Friday. So like, I'm never going to catch up to myself. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do this forever. Life's going to be good and I'm going to be famous. <laughs> Not famous, but successful and paying my bills with my hair. And, uh, and I did it in a comic book form. So, every issue had a standalone issue. My idea is that I get them printed later on those issues and sell them mm-hmm. and show them in the and in issue two, and at that point I had some, let's say, moderate success in the sense that people were checking it out, people were emailing and commenting, it was mm-hmm. going all right. And in issue two, I introduced a character named Adder, and it's decided in the in the story that they already know each other. Slice was kind of like the Superman of the world, and, and because he left that other planet and does come home to fight crime. Um, why not? So is he immortal? Has he been here since the 1100s? Yeah, actually, the original plot, the original plot of uh, the slice of fate was a flourishing miniseries, and it actually takes you through the beginnings of life to the end of his life. So at the end of the miniseries, they actually show you how he dies, oh. which was kind of fun. But then when I started issue one of the regular series, because I got up to like issue five, I yeah. did it for years, and when I when I got in there. Issue one of the regular series actually takes place as issue one of the mini series ended. They go through a portal because he meets someone who's going to tell him who he is and why he is. He's oh, okay, so he gets around to that. Issue one of the regular series is basically that story. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was going to do for just tell his entire story. So he was immortal, but he could be wounded, he could lose arms and stuff like that. And at the end of the end of issue four of the mini series, you see our hero as He's more a machine than men. And as a matter of fact, a friend of mine, I can show you, you guys can't see this, actually made a toy version of what Slice ended up looking like in issue four. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, That's that. really cool. He painted it and used stuff, and it was uh, um, Iron Man originally. Was an Iron I was going to say, it looks like an Iron Man body, yeah. Movie. That's really neat. So, uh, anyways, in issue two, I introduced this guy named Adam, and he was kind of me questioning why, when we read Spider-Man, and all of a sudden the Punisher's a guest here, or a guest here. He doesn't swear, he's not quite as rugged or tough, you know, when he's in Spider-Man. There's a lot of yeah. kids in Spider-Man, and so he's deluded when he, the Punisher comes in, he gets deluded. And like, can you have both of those? In that same world, because at that point I hadn't sworn in a slice of fate. Mm-hmm. There was no swearing at all. He used the, the hands and the stars and whatever. Oh, yeah. And uh, like, if I bring him in, he's going to swear. He's that character. And he's sort of loosely based on the idea of like, you know, characters from pulp fiction and stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. why he wears a black suit and his white shirt and ties and he's a little off and that. Yeah, I, I like that concept, uh, that part of it actually, just because he's, uh, it's it's like he's, I won't call him a superhero, but I like that he sort of has a costume and it's just sort of a, but it's like a, a like a societally accepted one. He just wears a suit, but like it's always a black and white suit. So it's, you know, he does have a look or a costume of sorts. And I always try to figure like every issue is like how many pages am I gonna get before it's all ripped to shreds and just yeah. your pants. Well, it's like Con- it's like Constantine. It's just a, a trench coat, but it was you know it's his look. You know, whenever exactly, you saw Constantine, right? you knew it was Constantine. <laughs> so it, he was the first time, and you know, I decided I was like, I'm gonna do it, full fledged swearing in this. You know, as like who really? You know, I got maybe a hundred people reading the thing, and mm-hmm. if they get offended, I'll be down to seventy five people, right? <laughs> I was like, all right, let's do this. And I decided to do it. And it was the first time that I had really, really gotten emails about the character and who he was. Because up to that point, it was just people asking me questions. And like, oh, you know, where'd you come up with this character? And people were like, wow, that's awesome. And there was a line, which when I say it out loud now, it sounds really stupid. And, I, and I've told this story to people before, and I can tell that it kind of falls flat with them. But it really resonated in the story. Uh, in the story, um, Slice is fighting this woman who comes from the other planet. She has blast powers, and I decide that if you're gonna have blast powers, like you get wet, you kind of like short out a little bit. You mm-hmm. can't really use blast powers as much, and so they fall into the water, and 
they kind of both fly up a little bit. And when they come out of the water, Slice is carrying this giant fish that he ran and grabbed out of the water he was in and chucked it up at her. And it basically knocks her back onto the beach and sand's flying everywhere and it basically knocks her out. And at that point, Adam runs onto the beach and sees what happened because <clears throat> he kind of got left behind a little bit. Are you okay? And he's laughing. He says, holy crap, did you beat that bitch with a fish? <laughs> Which I know kind of falls flat now. But people loved it. And then I got multiple emails about it. I said, wow, people really like this guy. Like They just like what that is. Yeah. Right? So I kept him in the back of my head. And it was only an issue two. I did three and four. And after four of the main series, I said, well, I'm going to do... I just need a little break from the slice stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do an Adam sort of like origin story mini thing. It was only going to be about six it was six pages long and it turned mm-hmm. into like a team this other thing that just dragged out and told this long winded way. And people liked it again. And the gist of that story was just Adam forgot that he was working for the creators. Mm-hmm. The origin story of Adam is that he died, he was a hitman, he was a terrible person. The creators, who was a four-armed woman, giant yellow elephant, and a little boy, who created everything that we know. Um, oh, so God really, does God does factor into your into your work. Actually, God does, and God does too, actually. Hey, cool. As well. <laughs> and uh, give God an extra a great story. Yes, um, true. Bible's, <laughs> Bible's full of good story. <laughs> he, he wakes up with the creators, they don't know how he got there because to them, when you die, you shouldn't go there. Mm-hmm. They're like, how did you get here? We don't know, but obviously you can go back and forth, so we're going to need you. We're going to lead you back to life. Go back and kill the things, our mistakes, for us. And that was the general idea, is that Adam comes back to Earth and he kills off the things that they created by accident. Interesting. Kind of reminds me a bit of, uh, did you, the, uh, you're a Punisher fan, of course. I, I, yeah. You remember when they killed him off uh, during that suicide run and then they did like that story where they brought him back and he was like a, like a hit man for heaven. Like his, <laughs> eye, his eyes glowed and he had the weird symbols on his head and he was killing like really bad people for like angels. It was I, really I, weird and disturbingly strange, like what crazy departure for the character. Yeah. Uh, they only brought it back when, it, I think they did it for a while and then it got canned. But then when uh, shortly after that's when Grant or um, no Gareth Ennis came on and did yeah. his Marvel his Marvel run and got like the seminal Punisher basically stories. Yeah, I actually never read those. I do know a bit, but I've never read. No, them. they're. I, I was think, more of a Punisher yeah. War Journal guy. I had a bunch of those. And... Yeah, Gareth Ennis is to me his stuff on it's fantastic. Yeah, I actually but, just finished reading his uh, Punisher Soviet. Oh, me too. Yeah, very yeah, good. I just finished reading. It. That was really good. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, where was it? Oh, yeah. So, anyways, uh, so I did this mini series with them. And the idea was that he forgot he was working for them, for the creators. And he was mm-hmm. just going off killing people again. He was doing his hitman thing again. So they brought him back to remind him. Oh, yeah. Just his brain got frazzled. That's all it was. Yeah. And in the gist of the story, there was a priest who was like molesting little boys and stuff. I'm sensing, I'm sensing a through line of religious uh, <laughs> iconography in some of your some of your stuff here. And, and, and he he the, the the beginning of the story is he's trying to kill the priest because he's, he's hired by this old mafia guy who the priest had molested as a child. Mm-hmm. He hires Adam to kill him, but his gun won't shoot him. Mm-hmm. Like he keeps clicking it and there's bullets in it and it won't shoot him. And then he looks in his gun and says, "What's wrong?" And then shoots himself in his face and. That's when he goes back to the creators and they're like, oh, you're not supposed to be doing this stuff. So when they send him back, he tricks one of the mothers of one of the kids that's being molested into going there and seeing her son sort of getting groomed. And she ends up killing the priest at the golf club. (laughs) So in essence, he didn't actually do the killing, but he did sort of push it straight to happen. Oh, very interesting. Um, It sounds like a very cool, like from what I've read, it sounds great. And plus, he had a great. Cameo in issue four of a uh, certain bald headed. That's right, yeah, the bald headed uh, bearded wrestler. I wanted to do a. a it's funny because now that we talk about the Highlander, Highlander, the first movie, anyways, 
pretty influential to me. Oh, so, you, you didn't like, enjoy all the others? I where it opens in a wrestling ring like it does. Yeah, it does. It's wrestling at the beginning of Finally they're watching wrestling. Like, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to put Andre in there as the wrestler in the ring. <laughs> It, it was great. I really liked it. I, your the picture, the little card you did of me as well was one that I've had hanging around for a while. I think it's still here. And, and Don Mancini actually makes his first appearance in that one too. Yes, that's true. He's well, Don Adam is... to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, what's next for Adam? Is it just ca- ca- carrying on with the story? Yeah. Uh, so he um, wrapped up issue five, which was sort of an origin story. There's two stories. Issue five was originally just going to be a silent issue. So mm-hmm. be no words in it whatsoever. Uh, but I had plans for issue six, and I decided, which was going to be the origin story. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't just going to be a, here's how it started. It was just going to be kind of like his story being told in the background of what was happening. Uh, but I changed my mind on what that was going to happen in issue six. So, so well, I'll sort of do the same thing with issue five. So issue five is all narration. So going back to get revenge for somebody and it's him basically talking to us about where he came from, what his childhood was, sort of how he ended up where he is now type of thing. Um, because I wanted to jump into this thing with issue six where he goes to a planet and he kind of finds, for lack of a better word, his name is Athenas and he's kind of like the king of the zombies. Mm-hmm. Uh, Athenas is actually Samantha backwards with the TH was supposed to be oh, yeah. um, which I got from Samantha Bowen uh, off the comments on this. Mm-hmm. Um, if you know your name backwards, it actually sounds really good for like a few and that's where that came from. <laughs> that's a cool name. Um, yeah, I like that you're are, uh, you're thinking. Hard, names are hard. <laughs> I hear you. I've been sitting on a few for I'm I'm starting to get pretty guilty about not doing any comic stuff lately, so I'm really uh I have a couple ideas and irons in the fire right now to get something going. I want to do something. I feel like there's a lot of pressure. I, I envy people like yourself that are, can pump out the issue after issue because um, I, uh, I I don't think I, for me, I just need to do like a graphic novel, like I'm done in one thing. So I, there's not so much pressure for me to get the next one done. And mm-hmm. I can do it, look at it, say it's finished, and then move on to something. I have one idea that I actually um, I haven't really talked about, but I've, I've been sitting on uh, for a while was... Uh, <laughs> I've been I, I've been learning to play guitar the last few years, and I think I'm getting okay at it. I'm not fantastic, but I enjoy it. And uh, I was just for fun. I was learning the Cat Came Back, you know the the Fred Penner song he used to sing all the time. I know it's not Fred <laughs> Penner originally, but in the line near the end where it talks about how the nukes fall and the world gets destroyed, and nothing's left and everything's gone, but the, you know the cat comes back. So I like the concept of like basically Earth is going to be destroyed, and the scientist is like throwing human knowledge and whatever into a, a rocket and sending it out into space. Just to, so maybe somebody will know what humanity was, even though because now it's ending, and then has sort of a, a mental debate and puts his cat in as well and sends it off. And then the whole th- the whole thing is like almost like little stories about other alien races and how they run with this cat interacting with them. And like you can make little nods on social commentary, like maybe one has a slave planet and one is this and one is that, with the cat sort of innocuously going around and being a part of these stories. But I just kind of like the idea of that. Um, so I'm a, I have cats. I'm a cat person. I think it'd be kind of fun. So that's the one I'm kicking around. I also have kind of a Mad Max meets uh, hockey idea. <laughs> yeah. So basically that's like a, a barren future where all of humanity lives in the north because that's where they can escape the fallout from like the world being destroyed. And, uh, and basically they keep the masses entertained by, uh, by essentially like death race style things where it's just a blood sport made out of hockey so everybody's got spikes and pads and razors and they're all just brutalizing each other i think it's a very canadian idea yeah i like it i like it that's the other one it's it's hard to come up with an idea and and sort of stick to it because i know i get ideas all the time i had an idea in my head recently that i just i think i've sort of given up on it that i can't quite uh well i sort of gave up on it but now i'm sort of like working on some Mm -hmm. the gist of it was that Aliens, as we know them, like the, the gray aliens with the mm-hmm. big eyes and stuff, aren't actually aliens. They're us involved, and they're coming back in time to just sort of explore their past and don't really care about us. So it's saying they we dig up, you know, to pop yeah. pieces and stuff. And I was like, there's an idea there that's kind of neat, but I can never quite put yeah. something on Sometimes it. Sometimes you got to rattle around your head for a bit, and then it, it kind of comes mm-hmm. to you. 
But uh, you, you know, know I, I'm working with somebody. I brought it up to somebody, and they're sort of oriented. The idea of um, like I recently got into because you know quarantine. I'm reading a lot of comics. So uh, two things you mentioned the silent issue, and it's funny you brought that up because I just I was re- I have all these huge runs of series that I never got around to reading that now I'm finding time to do read. So I finally read Fables, the whole run of it. Mm. Um, and it's very, very good, but I just finished it last night and I was like, all right, well, what am I going to read next? So I'm looking at all, like just massive amounts of stuff. And one of them is the Bruce Jones run on the Hulk. And I have all three volumes. So I picked it up and I was flipping through the first one. And it's got one of those when Marvel did the Nuff Said month where all the comics had no words in them. Mm. Remember when they did that? I was yeah. probably in high school. It was like 2002, maybe. But, you know, every single issue, there were no words in it. The uh, Grant Morrison's run in X-Men had a silent issue. Um, I think it was Peter Yeah, Joe. It was a silent issue. Yeah, Peter Jenkins did a, a silent issue. Spider-Man, like every single comic had a silent issue. So it's neat that you kind of got into that. Um, and the other it's thing was... the G.I. Joe one that I want to do. It, like, it was, it was the second time I've attempted to do it and then backed out of it. I, I think subconsciously I'm just scared to do a silent issue because they know that there's going to be a lot of plotting in the story, a lot of letting everyone understand without the use of words what's happening. Right? Yeah. I think, I get, I, think I'm, I, I get scared and I just, like, maybe that's what it is. I got scared. Yeah. So, well, you never, you got to push yourself crit- critically, right? Sometimes at night I feel comfortable, but I try to push myself sometimes out of those comfort mm-hmm. zones as well because you never know. But um, the other thing, what was I bringing? Oh, yes. I, I just uh, started, I noticed DC's been putting out all of, like the um, Jim Starlin, like the, the Batman before, the gray suit, blue cape Batman, kind of adventure Batman comics from like the 70s and 80s and 90s mm-hmm. um, before he went super, super dark, like all black suit and more of those sort of detective adventure kind of stories. So they, they're doing them under runs under the Cape Crusader and the Dark Knight Detective, I think. So mm-hmm. like they're big. I got several of the volumes. I've been flipping through some of them and I've been kind of thinking about just doing a fun old superhero comic without any pretensions or trying to change anything. Just, you know, doing something different. So I, I, I miss some of those stories, those fun adventure sort of things. I love the comics of all kinds, but there's a part of me that misses those style comics. You don't really see much anymore. The, the simple ones. It was hard when I got out of comics to get back into them because I didn't really know where to jump into them again. Yeah, you know? that's like, true. I don't remember what Marvel was doing that summer, but all the comics tied into it. And then, uh, that's the worst. I like whenever they do that, it, it drives me nuts because. Like I read Spider Man, but then they did like some Maximum Carnage or some not Maximum Carnage, but some Carnage event, Absolute Carnage or something recently. Yeah. So then all of a sudden the story stops and there's another story that connects to that in the middle of it that I I haven't been following any of the other books. So it's like I just really hate that. It takes you right out of it. Keep your if you want to do those events, keep in the mini series and that's just it. I think it's hard for maybe people who want to get into comic books that don't like I don't know what the future holds for the comic book industry. Um, because it, you know, it's an old art form at this point, and you know, kids want that instant satisfaction now. And you know, waiting a month to find out what happens after Spider Man fell off the building, you know, I don't know if kids really are into that anymore. You know, like I was really into it, but when you go into a store too to like oh you know, I'm gonna give this a shot again. Like everything's it's just so hard to tell. And actually I had a hard time. I bought Wolverine for a while because it's one of the books I grew up on. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, yeah, they changed Wolverine quite a bit and I'm not really digging the art and just couldn't get into it. It seems like they're really heading towards digital stuff now, especially with everything going on because they stopped. Yeah, reading. they can't do that. I yeah, I don't it's, they can't do it. it's the same with me. Like I have read books digitally too. Like I've read some comics digitally and I've read a novel or two digitally and I just I don't know why. I just like the book, man. And I don't wanna it's fine. Like I don't don't hate it anybody that the big that, that gets their stuff that way, but uh, I do. I just I like the physical copy. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I hate those mothers. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, uh, I think that's time. Uh, I feel like we've covered most of the the genesis of your life up to this point. Mm. You feel good about the interview? You think you're all right? I think I do fantastic. I think you did fantastic. I think you did too. Well, thanks for being on, uh, uh, Andrew. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm definitely be seeing you at a convention hopefully soon once they once they come back. 
Yeah. Really be a while. BCCE. Pardon? That's supposed to be this weekend. I know. I know. It's. Uh, I've been getting those. I those calls from different places that, they're not calls, but emails, like saying, you know, well, you're it's pushed back or it's not this year. ECC just canceled, did they not? Uh, they can't. Well, I think it was like a month ago or something. Yeah, but they. I just told them to keep my my table until next time. So, so hopefully, be there back there in 2021. They gave me yeah. an option to either get a refund or just uh, let them keep it, and then you have your table for the next one. So, yeah. I gave them that option. So why not? I'm going to miss it, but hopefully we'll get it soon. Get it back. Exactly. All right. Well, great talking to you, man. Thanks a lot. You too, man. Thank you for this. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. And that was my conversation with Andrew Clark, independent comic book creator of Adam, amongst other things. As he mentioned, a Slice of Life was also something that was one of his earlier books that I'm sure is out there. You can find Adam in most of your local comic book stores if you live in Nova Scotia. If you are international, then be sure to check out his art and maybe drop him a line online. Perhaps he can make sure you get those comics into your hands. Great conversation. I could have talked all night with Andrew. He was a very easy conversation, a very interesting guy, and I learned a lot about him and about hemophilia, which is not something I expected to learn about in today's interview, but I learned a lot more than I ever knew before, which is very interesting. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing it, so that is wonderful. Uh, Next week, we will be back with another of the standard format. This time, we'll be discussing the graphic history of Darkseid or Dark Seed, if you want to pronounce it incorrectly. However, Dark Side is the Jack Kirby creation, the new god villain, and the very interesting villain from the DC Universe. So I'm excited to see him. He will be featured in the HBO Max miniseries of Justice League, the Snyder Cut, which will be coming out sometime next year, I'm guessing. And so that's kind of put him back in the forefront of the public eye. Not looking super forward to that, but I am a fan of Dark Side, so I am excited to do a little more research and bring you his story. So thank you very much for listening to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name was Andre Mayette, and I will see you next week. And before I go, make sure to hit subscribe on whatever service you're using to listen to this podcast. Hopefully it's one of the usuals. Uh, we are currently on CastBox, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. So if you listen to us on one of those, please make sure to hit subscribe. It would make me happy. It'll make you happy. And in the end, it'll allow me to hopefully someday monetize this and make a little money off of my, my, my creation. But even if it doesn't, I'll still be here because I love it and I love you. And thank you very much for joining me. I will see you next week.